1837, audiences throughout Massachusetts witnessed an astonishing spectacle. Two sisters from a wealthy Southern family toured the state, giving fiery speeches denouncing the evils of slavery. Women lecturers were rare in the 1830s, but Sarah and Angelina Grimke were on a mission. Whilst in the act of speaking, Angelina explained, I am favored to forget little I entirely and to feel altogether hid behind the great cause I am pleading. In their 79 speaking engagements that year, 40,000 women and men came to hear them. Little in their family background predicted the sisters' radicalism. They grew up among the elite of Charleston, South Carolina. Their father was chief justice to the state Supreme Court. Nonetheless, they developed independent minds and a hatred of slavery. In the 1820s, both sisters moved to Philadelphia and joined the Quakers' Society of Friends. The abolitionist movement was still in its infancy in the 1830s. In 1835, Angelina Grimke wrote to William Lloyd Garrison, editor of the Boston Liberator, describing herself as a white southern exile from slavery. Garrison published her letter, which caused a stir and propelled her into her new career. The Sisters' 1837 tour of Massachusetts doubled the membership of northern anti-slavery societies. Newspapers and religious leaders fiercely debated the Grimke's boldness in presuming to lecture to men. The sisters defended their stand. Whatever is morally right for a man to do is morally right for a woman to do, Angelina wrote. I recognize no rights but human rights. Sarah produced a set of essays titled Letters on the Equality of the Sexes in 1838, the first American treatise asserting women's equality with men. The Grimke sisters' radicalism emerged from the vibrant, contested public life that developed in the 1830s. This decade, often called the Age of Jackson after the president, saw rapid economic, political, and social change. Old social hierarchies eroded. Ordinary men dreamed of success and fortune. Advances in transportation and economic productivity fueled these dreams, sending thousands of people west. Urban growth and technological changes spread exhilarating new ideas through an expanding periodical press. Expanded communication dramatically transformed politics. Sharp disagreements arose over questions of individual liberty, economic opportunity, and national prosperity. These fights shaped the political parties that reemerged in the early 1830s, attracting large numbers of white male voters into their ranks. Religion became democratized as well. An extraordinary evangelical revival brought its adherents the certainty that salvation was available to all. It all came at a steep cost, however. Steamboats blew up, banks and businesses periodically collapsed, and alcoholism soared. New opportunities for whites resulted from the murder of Indians and the theft of their lands. Much of the economy, in the South as well as the North, rested on the foundation of a brutalized slave labor force. The brash confidence that turned some people into rugged, self-promoting individuals inspired others to think about the human costs of rapid economic expansion and about how to reform society. The common denominator was a faith that people and societies could shape their own destinies. The return of peace in 1815 unleashed powerful forces that transformed the economy. Innovations in transportation facilitated the movement of commodities, information, and people. Textile mills and other factories in new industries created thousands of wage-earning jobs. Innovations in banking, legal practices, and tariff policies promoted rapid economic growth. If these changes did not amount to an industrial revolution, they accelerated the pace of economic activity and the number of people pulled into national and international markets. This new economy carried serious risks, however, as periodic economic crashes revealed. Before 1815, transportation in the United States was slow and expensive. It cost as much to ship a crate over 30 miles of domestic roads as it did to send it across the Atlantic Ocean. A stagecoach took four days to travel from Boston to New York. Between 1815 and 1840, networks of roads, canals, steamboats, and finally railroads dramatically raised the speed and lowered the cost of travel. Improved transportation moved goods into wider markets. It moved passengers, too, allowing people to take up new employment in cities or factory towns. Transportation facilitated the flow of political information— 
the U.S. mail offered bargain postal rates for newspapers, periodicals, and books. Infrastructure like roads and canals was expensive, however, and produced uneven economic benefits. Presidents from Jefferson to Monroe resisted funding it with federal dollars. Instead, private investors pooled resources and chartered transport companies, receiving significant subsidies and monopoly rights from state governments. Turnpike and roadway mileage increased substantially after 1815. Stagecoach companies proliferated, and travel times on main routes were cut in half, even as costs fell sharply. Water travel was similarly transformed. In 1807, Robert Fulton's steam-propelled boat, the Claremont, churned up the Hudson River from New York City to Albany, touching off a steamboat craze. By the early 1830s, more than 700 steamboats operated along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers alone. Steamboats were not benign, however. The urge to cut travel time led to overstoked furnaces, sudden boiler explosions, and mass fatalities. An investigation of an accident near Cincinnati that killed 150 passengers in 1838 concluded, Such disasters have their foundation in the present mammoth evil of our country, an inordinate love of gain. We are not satisfied with getting rich, but we must get rich in a day. We are not satisfied with traveling at a speed of 10 miles an hour, but we must fly. By the mid-1830s, nearly 3,000 Americans had died in steamboat accidents, prompting the first federal attempt to regulate safety on vessels in interstate commerce. Environmental costs intensified. Steamboats had to load fuel every 20 miles or so. Mass deforestation resulted. By the 1830s, the banks of many rivers were denuded of trees, and forests miles back from the rivers fell to the axe. The smoke from wood-burning steamboats created America's first significant air pollution. Canals were another major innovation of the period. Canal boats powered by mules moved slowly, less than five miles per hour, but the low-friction water enabled one mule to pull a 50-ton barge. Several states launched major government-sponsored canal enterprises, the most impressive being the Erie Canal, finished in 1825. It stretched 350 miles between Albany and Buffalo and linked the Hudson River with the entire Great Lakes region. Wheat and flour moved east, household goods and tools moved west, and passengers went in both directions. By the 1830s, the cost of shipping by canal fell to less than one-tenth the cost of overland transport. New York City, at the mouth of the Hudson, blossomed into the premier commercial city in the United States. In the 1830s, private railroad companies heavily subsidized by state legislatures began to compete with canals. The nation's first railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio, laid 13 miles of track in 1829. By 1840, workers had built 3,000 more miles of track nationwide. Rail lines in the 1830s were generally short, on the order of 20 to 100 miles. They did not yet provide an efficient distribution system for goods. Bear in mind, also, that until the 1840s, when steam locomotives were invented, rail travel was by horses pulling large carriages on the rails. But passengers flocked to experience the marvelous speeds of 15 to 20 miles per hour. Railroads and other advances in transportation began to unify the country culturally and economically. With transportation advances expanding the market for goods, manufacturing boomed after 1815. The two leading industries, textiles and shoes, altered methods of production and labor relations. The development of water-driven machinery along rivers spurred textile production. Shoe manufacturing, still using the power and skill of human hands, saw a reorganization of production. Both industries pulled young women into wage-earning labor for the first time. An English immigrant built the first textile factory in the United States in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. By 1815, nearly 170 spinning mills stood along New England rivers. British manufacturers generally hired entire families for mill work. American factory owners changed this model by hiring young single women. They assumed female labor was cheaper because women had limited employment options and generally left to get married after a few years of work. The association of spinning as women's work also made it more acceptable to hire young women. In 1821, a group of Boston entrepreneurs founded the town of Lowell on the Merrimack River, 
It offered a new model of cloth manufacturing by centralizing all aspects of production, combing, shrinking, spinning, weaving, and dyeing. By 1836, the eight Lowell Mills employed more than 5,000 young women who lived in carefully managed company-owned boarding houses. Company rules at the Lowell Mills required church attendance and prohibited drinking and unsupervised courtship. Dorms were locked at 10 p.m. A typical mill worker earned 2 to $3 for a 70-hour week, more than a seamstress or domestic servant could earn, but less than a man's wages. Despite the long hours, young women embraced factory work as a means to earn spending money and build savings before marriage. Several banks in town held the nest eggs of thousands of factory workers. Many of these young workers relished the freedom of living in an all-female social space, away from parents and liberated from domestic chores. In the evening, the women could engage in self-improvement activities like public lectures. In 1837, 1,500 mill girls crowded Lowell City Hall to hear Angelina and Sarah Grimke speak about the evils of slavery. In the mid-1830s, Worldwide competition in the cotton market forced mill owners to speed up work and reduce wages. The workers protested. The communal living arrangements fostered solidarity, while the workers' relative independence as temporary employees encouraged their boldness. In 1834, and again in 1836, hundreds of women at Lowell went on strike. In 1834, mill workers in Dover, New Hampshire, denounced their owners for trying to turn them into quote-unquote slaves. In the end, however, the ease of replacing these relatively unskilled workers undermined their bargaining power. Surprised by the women's assertiveness, owners in the 1840s began to shift to immigrant families as their primary labor source. The shoe manufacturing industry centered in eastern New England also experimented with new forms of labor. Manufacturers reorganized production by hiring women, including married women, as shoe binders. Male shoemakers still cut the leather and made the soles in shops, but female shoe binders working from home now stitched the upper parts of the shoes. Working from home meant that wives could contribute to family income, unusual for most wives in that period, and still perform their domestic chores. In the economically turbulent 1830s, shoe binder wages fell. Unlike mill workers, female shoe binders worked in isolation, hindering their ability to organize collectively. In Lynn, Massachusetts, a major shoemaking center, women used female church networks to organize resistance, communicating via religious newspapers. The Lynn shoebinders, who demanded higher wagers in 1834, expressed a collective understanding of themselves not just as workers, but as female workers. In the end, the Lynn shoebinders' protests failed to increase wages. At-home workers all over New England continued to accept low wages. Even in Lynn, many women shied away from organized protest. They preferred to situate their work in the context of family duty, helping their husbands finish the shoes, instead of market relations. Entrepreneurs like the Lowell factory owners relied on innovations in the banking system to finance their ventures. In just two years, between 1814 and 1816, the number of state-chartered banks in the United States more than doubled, from fewer than 90 to 208. By 1830, there were 330, and by 1840, hundreds more. Banks stimulated the economy by making loans to merchants and manufacturers and by enlarging the money supply. Borrowers received loans in the form of banknotes, certificates unique to each bank, that were used as money. Neither federal nor state governments issued paper money, so banknotes issued by hundreds of individual banks became the country's currency. Constant uncertainty about the true worth of a banknote created substantial risk for the economy since it was hard to know how stable any particular bank might be. The sheer variety of notes in circulation also created ideal conditions for counterfeiters. Bankers exercised great power over the economy by deciding who would get loans at what interest rate. The most powerful bankers sat on the board of directors for the Second Bank of the United States, headquartered in Philadelphia with 18 branches across the country. The 20-year charter for the First Bank of the United States had expired in 1811. After surprisingly little debate, the Second Bank of the United States opened for business in 1816 under another 20-year charter. The rechartering of this Second Bank would become a major issue in the 1832 presidential campaign.
Lawyers and politicians significantly shaped the early U.S. economy by refashioning commercial law to increase private investment. In 1811, states began to rewrite their laws of incorporation. The number of corporations exploded from about 20 in 1800 to 1800 by 1817. Incorporation protected individual investors from liability for corporate debts. State lawmakers also wrote laws of eminent domain, empowering states to buy land for roads and canals, even from unwilling sellers. These new laws created the foundation for a market economy that facilitated risk-taking, encouraged innovation, and promoted economic development. Not everyone applauded these developments. Andrew Jackson, a lawyer-turned-politician, spoke for a large segment of the population when he warned about the potential abuses of power which the moneyed interest derives from a paper currency which they are able to control and from the multitude of corporations with exclusive privileges. Jacksonians believed that abolishing government-granted privileges was the surest path to individual liberty and economic opportunity. As the economy made more room for risk-taking, periodic financial collapses resulted. The exhilarating boom years from 1815 to 1818 led to the first sharp, large-scale economic downturn in U.S. history. Americans called it a panic. Some blamed the Panic of 1819 on the Second Bank of the United States for inflating an economic bubble and then suddenly contracting the money supply. A financial crisis in Europe in the spring of 1819 accelerated the downturn. Overseas, Prices for American cotton, tobacco, and wheat plummeted by more than 50%. As confidence collapsed, so did banks' willingness to extend credit. When they began to call in their outstanding loans, debtors in the commodities trade found themselves unable to pay. Business and personal bankruptcies skyrocketed, creating more debtors unable to pay their loans, leading to more bank failures. It was a vicious cycle. Because of this intricate web of credit and debt relationships, the panic affected almost everyone connected to the new commercial economy. Thousands of Americans lost their savings and property. An estimated half a million people lost their jobs. Recovery took several years. Unemployment declined, but bitterness lingered, waiting to be stirred up by politicians in the decades to come. The dangers of a system dependent on credit had become clear. In one folksy formulation that circulated around 1820, a farmer compared credit to a man pissing in his britches on a cold day to keep his arse warm. Very comfortable at first, but I dare say you know how it feels afterwards. By the mid-1820s, the economy was growing once again, driven by productivity increases, consumer demand, and international trade. Despite the Panic of 1819, credit continued to fuel the system, and the network of credit and debt relations grew denser still. Confidence and continued growth supported the elaborate system, but a single business failure could produce panic and many victims. Long after the Panic of 1819 had ended, an undercurrent of anxiety about rapid economic change still troubled many Americans. Just as the years after 1815 saw the emergence of a new market economy, the years of Andrew Jackson's presidency saw the emergence of a new style of party politics. Like the new economy, the birth of this second party system was slow and uneven. Not until 1836 would political parties have distinct names and consistent programs transcending the individuals running for office. Over those years, more men could and did vote, expanding the scope of American democracy. The election of 1828, which pitted Andrew Jackson against John Quincy Adams, was the first presidential contest in which the popular vote determined the outcome. In 22 out of 24 states, voters, not state legislatures, designated the number of electors committed to a particular candidate. The Adams-Jackson rematch generated intense political interest. More than a million voters participated, three times the number in 1824, nearly half the free male population. But it was only the beginning of the era's intense partisanship. Throughout the 1830s, as property qualifications tumbled, voter turnout continued to rise, reaching 70% in some localities. The 1828 election also inaugurated a new style of campaigning. For the first time, state-level candidates routinely gave speeches at rallies, picnics, and banquets. Adams and Jackson held to an older tradition, declining such appearances as undignified. 
but Henry Clay of Kentucky, campaigning for Adams, earned the nickname the Barbecue Orator. Campaign rhetoric became more informal. The Jackson camp established hickory clubs, trading on Jackson's popular nickname, Old Hickory, from a common Tennessee tree associated with resilience and toughness. Growing numbers of partisan newspapers shaped issues and publicized political personalities as never before. Improved printing technology and rising literacy rates drove the expansion of newspapers as well as other kinds of popular printed materials. Party leaders subsidized newspapers or provided other favors for editors, even in remote towns and villages. Political news traveled swiftly in the mail, reprinted in allied newspapers. Presidential campaigns were now coordinated in a national arena. At first, politicians identified themselves as Jackson or Adams men, honoring the fiction of Democratic-Republican unity. By 1832, however, the terminology had evolved to National Republicans, who favored federal action to promote commercial development, and Democratic Republicans, who promised fidelity to the majority. Between 1834 and 1836, National Republicans came to be called Whigs while Jackson's party became the Democrats. Perhaps because it was the first popularly decided presidential election, the campaign of 1828 was also the first to center on claims about morality, honor, and discipline. It was also the first dominated by scandal and questions of personal character. In the run-up to the election, Jackson and Adams came to represent two dramatically different styles of manhood. John Quincy Adams' opponents vilified him as an elitist, a bookish academic, even a monarchist. They attacked his corrupt bargain of 1824, the alleged deal between Adams and Henry Clay that led to Adams' election in the House of Representatives. Adams' supporters countered by playing on Jackson's fatherless childhood to portray him as the bastard son of a prostitute. Playing on the cloudy circumstances around his marriage to Rachel Donaldson Robards in 1791, Jackson's enemies peddled the claim that he was a seducer and an adulterer and had married a woman not legally divorced from her first husband. Pro-Adams newspapers played up Jackson's impulsive and violent temper, as seen in his many duels, brawls, and canings. Jackson's supporters used the same stories to paint Old Hickory as a tough frontier hero who knew how to command obedience. Pro-Adams editors portrayed their candidate as pious, learned, and virtuous. Jackson's supporters responded that their candidate's rough frontier education endowed him with a superior common sense. Jackson won a sweeping victory, with 56% of the popular vote and 178 electoral votes to Adams' 83. Jackson took most of the South and West and carried Pennsylvania and New York as well. Adams carried the remainder of the East. Jackson's vice president was John C. Calhoun, who had just served as vice president under Adams but had broken with Adams' policies. After 1828, national politicians no longer deplored the existence of political parties, In this new, increasingly democratic society, parties came to be seen as an inevitable feature of the nation's political life. Indeed, many Americans began to believe that political parties might even carry some advantages. They mobilized and delivered voters, organized coalitions of interest groups, and created a framework in which political and ideological differences could be settled mostly peacefully. But modern political parties had not quite taken on their fully developed form. In 1832 and 1836, they still turned on the sharply defined characters of Adams and Jackson. On the one hand were the Whigs, a moralistic party more comfortable with hierarchy and top-down forms of political action. On the other hand were the Democrats, a contentious, energetic party that embraced liberty-loving individualism and promoted a radically egalitarian society for white men. Before the inauguration in March 1829, Rachel Jackson died. Certain that the ugly campaign had hastened his wife's death, the president went into deep mourning. His health deteriorated due to constant pain from a bullet still lodged against his lung from an 1806 duel and due to mercury poisoning from the medicines he took. At 62, Jackson carried only 140 pounds on his 6-foot-1-inch frame. His adversaries doubted that he would live to a second term.
His supporters, however, went wild at his March 1829 inauguration. Thousands cheered his 10-minute inaugural address, the shortest in history. An open reception at the White House turned riotous as well-wishers jammed the premises, used windows as doors, stood on furniture for a better view of the president, spit tobacco juice all over the wood floors and carpets, and broke thousands of dollars' worth of china and glasses. For Jackson's opponents, the chaos symbolized the disorder of this new democratic order coming into being. But Jackson was not discouraged. During his presidency, he offered unprecedented hospitality to the public. Echoing Jefferson's openness, he committed to his image as a president of the common man, continuing to hold audiences with unannounced visitors throughout his two terms of office. Since George Washington's administration, presidents had tried to reduce party conflict by including men of different political views in their cabinets. Jackson broke with this tradition by appointing only party loyalists to his cabinet, a practice most presidents have followed ever since. For Secretary of State, he tapped New Yorker Martin Van Buren, one of the shrewdest politicians of the day. Throughout the federal government, from postal clerks to ambassadors, Jackson replaced civil servants with party loyalists. Jackson's opponents called these appointments a spoils system, after a Democratic politician coined the slogan, To the victor belong the spoils. Jackson soon began implementing his agenda, built on a Jeffersonian view of limited federal government. Believing that intervention in the economy inevitably favored some groups at the expense of others, Jackson opposed federal support for transportation and grants of monopolies and charters. Like Jefferson, he championed the rapid settlement of the country's interior, where widespread landholding would foster a democratic culture among settlers. Removing Indians from their lands was therefore among his highest priorities. Compared to other presidents, Jackson more freely used his veto power over Congress. In 1830, he vetoed a highway project in Maysville, Kentucky, Henry Clay's home state. The Maysville Road veto symbolized Jackson's belief that public money should be spent on projects of a general, not local, character. In all, Jackson vetoed 12 bills, all previous presidents combined had exercised that power a total of nine times. In his two terms as president, Andrew Jackson's vision for the country was of a nation of opportunity exclusively for white men. That vision, however, was built on the violent expulsion of Indians from their lands. To accomplish his objectives, Jackson forcibly relocated tens of thousands of Indian people still living east of the Mississippi River. A fervent nationalist, he dramatically confronted the state of South Carolina when it tried to nullify the tariff of 1828. Disapproving of government-granted privilege, Jackson fought against the Second Bank of the United States. In all these actions and more, he greatly enhanced the power of the presidency. Probably nothing defined Jackson's presidency more than his efforts to solve what he saw as the Indian problem. Indeed, it was one of the central threads of his career. Jackson had first gained fame in his battles with the Creek and Seminole nations in the 18-teens. For all their forced land sessions, however, thousands of Indians still lived in the South, where they held millions of acres. In addition, many other Native Americans remained in the Old Northwest, New England, and New York. Jackson's presidency would change all that. In his first message to Congress in 1829, Jackson announced his ambition to remove Indians to territory west of the Mississippi. It was, he declared, the only way to save them. White civilization had destroyed Indian resources, he claimed, dooming them to waste away. That this fate surely awaits them if they remain within the limits of the states does not admit of a doubt. Humanity and national honor demand that every effort should be made to avert so great a calamity. Thus did Jackson, who had fought Indians in the Southwest from the beginning of his career and now determined to seize their remaining land, position himself implausibly not as their tormentor, but as their savior. The roots of Indian removal go back to the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. In 1802, the state of Georgia ceded its western land claims to the federal government, and in return, Congress agreed to secure, on reasonable and peaceful terms, title to Cherokee and Creek lands within the state as soon as possible. 
In the winter of 1802-1803, President Jefferson told Delaware and Shawnee delegates in Washington that he would respect existing treaties. At the same time, however, Jefferson was implementing plans to dispossess the Indians of their lands. Jefferson and others easily solved the dilemma of how to take Indian lands with apparent honor by determining that too much land was a disincentive for Indians to become civilized. Ignoring the role of agriculture in eastern woodland societies, they argued that Indians would continue to hunt rather than settle down as farmers unless their options were restricted. Taking their lands forced Indians into a settled agricultural and so-called civilized way of life and was, therefore, good for them in the long run. The process of dispossession could be comfortably accomplished within Jefferson's philosophy of minimal government. The government could do little to regulate the frontier and protect Indian lands, causing Indians to fight for their land. The government would then have no choice but to invade Indian country, suppress the uprising, and dictate treaties in which defeated Indians signed away land. The stage was then set for the process to repeat itself. Jefferson's strategy for acquiring Indian lands resulted in some 30 treaties with a dozen or so tribal groups and the cession of almost 200,000 square miles of Indian territory in nine states. Jefferson regretted that Indians seemed doomed to extinction, but he showed little compunction in taking away their homelands. Some Indians moved west voluntarily. Others determined never to abandon their ancestral lands. But in the early decades of the century, the pressure to move west mounted steadily. Americans who hated Indians and desired their lands favored removal as a means of freeing up territory. Although many New Englanders denounced the removal policies in the South, many other Americans who were sympathetic to the Indians also favored removal on humanitarian grounds as being the only way to protect them from their rapacious neighbors. This was, after all, Jackson's argument. Other politicians expressed similar views, declaring that a few thousand Indians could not be allowed to stand in the way of proper human progress. Indians did not put the land to good use, they said, and could not be allowed to deny that land to American farmers. Thomas Jefferson had regarded Indians as culturally inferior, but capable of improvement with the proper instruction. Jackson regarded Indians as racially inferior and incapable of change. In Jackson's view, even the so-called civilized tribes must, in fact, be savages. Civilization and progress demanded that savagery be eradicated. In the 1830s and 40s, the United States relocated about 80,000 Indian people from their eastern homelands. Today, we would call such a policy ethnic cleansing. The irony in Jackson's argument lay in the fact that the Indians whom Americans seemed most anxious to expel from their lands were people who, even by their own definition, Americans termed civilized. The Cherokees, Creeks, Choctaws, Chickasaws, and Seminoles became known as the so-called Five Civilized Tribes. In 1827, the Cherokees restructured their tribal government into a constitutional republic modeled after that of the United States, with a written constitution, an independent judiciary, a Supreme Court, a principal chief, and a two-house legislature. They had a written language based on the syllabary developed by Sequoia, who devoted a dozen years to creating a written version of the Cherokee language. In 1828, they established a newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix, which was published in both Cherokee and English. The editor of the Phoenix, Elias Boudinot, had received an education at a Moravian school in North Carolina and at the American Board's Foreign Mission School in Cornwall, Connecticut. Boudinot and his cousin, John Ridge, the son of Major Ridge, Speaker of the Cherokee Council who had fought as an ally of Andrew Jackson during the Creek War, attended the mission school together. The Cherokees seemed to have everything the United States required of them to take their place in the new nation as a self-supporting, functioning republic of farmers. Some Cherokees displayed more of the attributes of supposedly civilized society than did many of the American frontiersmen who were so eager to occupy their lands. John Ridge wrote for the Phoenix and served as an interpreter and secretary to delegations in Washington. You asked us to throw off the hunter and the warrior state, said Ridge in a speech in Philadelphia in 1832. We did so, 
You asked us to form a Republican government. We did so, adopting your own as a model. You asked us to cultivate the earth and learn the mechanic arts. We did so. You asked us to learn to read. We did so. You asked us to cast away our idols and worship your God. We did so. But it did not save them. Indeed, their very success and prosperity only increased pressure from neighbors eager to get their hands on Cherokee land. Cherokee territory originally extended into five southeastern states, but by the 1820s, most of the remaining Cherokees were confined to Georgia. Gold was discovered in Cherokee country in 1827, and prospectors flooded into the area. In December, the Georgia legislature passed a resolution asserting its sovereignty over Cherokee lands within the state's borders. Georgia demanded that the U.S. government begin negotiations to compel the Cherokees to cede their land. The lands in question belong to Georgia, the legislators asserted. She must and will have them. Georgia subjected the Cherokees to a systematic campaign of harassment, intimidation, and deception, culminating in a sustained assault on their government. The state applied to the Cherokees not only general laws governing all citizens, but also special laws aimed only at Cherokees with a direct intent to destroy the political, economic, and social infrastructure of the nation. It prohibited meetings of the tribal council and closed down the tribal courts. It deprived Cherokees of their right to legal protest and made it illegal for Cherokees to testify in court against whites, dig for gold, or try to dissuade other Cherokees from moving west. In 1830, Georgia created a police force, the Georgia Guard, to patrol Cherokee country. Over the next few years, the Guard harassed Cherokee people, arrested Principal Chief John Ross, and seized his papers and confiscated the Cherokee printing press. Elias Boudinot appealed to Washington in words that proved prophetic. The state of Georgia has taken a strong stand against us, and the United States must either defend us in our rights or leave us to our foe. In the former case, the general government will redeem her pledge solemnly given in treaties. In the latter, she will violate her promise of protection, and we cannot, in future, depend consistently upon any guarantee made by her to us, either here or beyond the Mississippi. In May 1830, after extensive debate and a close vote in both houses, and despite widespread opposition from church and reform groups throughout much of the country, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, authorizing the president to negotiate treaties of removal with all Indian tribes living east of the Mississippi. Almost immediately, surveyors and squatters entered Cherokee country, and Georgia stepped up its campaign of harassment. The Cherokees decided to fight Georgia in the federal courts. In 1831, the Cherokee Nation brought suit against the state of Georgia in the U.S. Supreme Court. Chief Justice John Marshall declared that the court lacked jurisdiction over the case since the Cherokees were neither U.S. citizens nor an independent nation. They and all other Indian tribes residing within the United States were, in his words, domestic dependent nations. The next year, however, a Vermont missionary brought suit challenging Georgia's right to exert its authority over him in Cherokee country. Because the suit involved a U.S. citizen, it fell within the Supreme Court's jurisdiction. In Worcester v. Georgia, the court found that the Cherokee Nation was, quote, a distinct community occupying its own territory, end quote, in which the laws of Georgia can have no force. The court's decision was one of the most important in the history of U.S. Indian relations, but it was not enough to save the Cherokees. Georgia would not tolerate a sovereign Cherokee nation within its boundaries, nor would it tolerate federal protection of that sovereignty. Georgia ignored the Supreme Court's ruling with Jackson's vocal encouragement. By the 1830s, the South was producing about half the cotton consumed in the world and growing rich, exporting much of it to the cotton mills of northern England and France, while almost as much was sent to New England and New York. In the view of Southerners, Indian lands were too valuable to be left in Indian hands. Southern Indians faced a choice between gradual destitution and removal. Most bowed to the inevitable. In 1835, the United States signed a dubious Treaty of Nuichota with a minority of Cherokees who agreed to move west voluntarily. The treaty party included Major Ridge, John Ridge, 
Elias Boudinot, and others who had formerly resisted removal but now felt they had no alternative but to migrate. Major Ridge had executed a Cherokee chief named Doublehead for selling tribal land in 1806 and had authored the Cherokee law prohibiting land sales. He knew what the consequences of his action were likely to be. I have signed my death warrant, he said, as he put his name to the treaty. Principal Chief John Ross and the majority of his people denounced the treaty as fraudulent and refused to abide by it. In 1838, citing the Treaty of New Echota, Federal troops rounded up most of the Cherokees, placed them in stockaded internment camps, and then relocated them across the Mississippi. About one quarter of the Cherokees, including John Ross's wife, died on the aptly named Trail of Tears. Thousands of other Indian people perished on their journeys west. For the Cherokees, the march west to Indian territory was the most traumatic move in a history of recurrent migration. It marked the beginning of a new era in which they would have to adjust to life in a strange land and recreate their societies in the area that became the state of Oklahoma. In 1839, unknown assailants killed Major Ridge, John Ridge, and Elias Boudinot, the leaders of the treaty party who had ceded Cherokee land. John Ridge was dragged from his bed and beaten to death in front of his wife and children. The assassinations sparked a cycle of revenge killings and plunged the Cherokees into a state of virtual war that lasted seven years. Some southern Indians managed to stay in their traditional lands. Some Choctaws stayed in Mississippi. Some Cherokees evaded the American drive west and survived in North Carolina as the Eastern Band of Cherokees. Florida Seminoles refused to remove and, in the Second Seminole War, fought the U.S. Army to a standstill from their stronghold in the Everglades. The federal government spent millions of dollars, deployed thousands of troops, and lost 1,500 men. Despite the capture by treachery of their leader, Chief Osceola, under a flag of truce and his subsequent death in prison, some Seminoles remained defiant in their Florida homelands. In the North, Implementing the removal policy meant dealing with a variety of tribes and bands, many of which had migrated from one region to another, and many of which were already living on a fraction of their former lands. Between 1829 and 1851, the United States signed 86 treaties with 26 northern tribes between New York and the Mississippi. Other tribes joined the general pattern of coerced migration beyond the Mississippi. In 1832, the Sauk chief Black Hawk returned with his people to plant corn in their Illinois homelands after wintering in Iowa. American settlers occupying the area claimed that they were being invaded. The Illinois militia, including a young Abraham Lincoln, although he saw no combat, was called out, federal troops were brought in, and many of the Sauk's enemies made common cause with the Americans. The so-called Black Hawk War culminated at the Battle of Bad Axe as Black Hawk's band tried to escape across the Mississippi. Caught between the American riflemen on the shore and an American steamboat spewing grape shot from its cannon, at least 150 men, women, and children were shot down, many in cold blood. Others who escaped the slaughter and made it across the river were killed by Sioux. Black Hawk was captured and imprisoned, then later taken on a humiliating tour of the East and related his quote-unquote autobiography. Citing the unprovoked war as justification, the United States stripped the Sauks of their lands in treaties in 1833, 1836, 1837, and 1842. Most Sauks eventually removed to new homes in Kansas. Contrary to what some Americans asserted, the country to which the eastern tribes were removed was not empty. The United States carved its Indian Territory out of the homelands of Omahas, Otos, Missouris, Kansas, Pawnees, and Osages, who regarded the newcomers as invaders. The Osages, who had dominated the southern prairies in the 18th century, clashed repeatedly with Cherokees in the Arkansas country. Relations between native inhabitants and native immigrants from the east remained tense for years. The Osages were also coming under increasing pressure from the United States to give up their lands and their way of life, although they fended off missionaries' attempts to change them and held on to their traditional beliefs. During the Jacksonian era, economic policy was a central topic of political debate. 
the most heated controversies erupted over tariffs or taxes on imports. In the 1830s, a fight over tariffs turned into a constitutional crisis pitting federal against state power. In order to shelter American manufacturers from foreign competition, Congress had passed steep federal tariffs on imports such as textiles and iron goods in 1816 and again in 1824. Many Southern congressmen opposed the tariffs. Their states, reliant on exports of agricultural crops like cotton, gained nothing from the support for manufacturing, which was heavily concentrated in the North. By reducing foreign trade, however, tariffs hurt Southern economies. In 1828, Congress passed a revised tariff that came to be known as the Tariff of Abominations. A bundle of conflicting duties, some as high as 50%, the legislation contained provisions that pleased and angered every economic and sectional interest. South Carolina particularly suffered from the 1828 tariff. Worldwide prices for cotton had declined in the late 1820s, squeezing the southern economy, and the tariffs made a bad situation worse. In response, a group of southern politicians headed by John C. Calhoun advanced a doctrine called nullification. They argued that states had the right to nullify federal law when Congress overstepped its constitutional powers. As precedents, they pointed to the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions of 1798 intended to invalidate the Alien and Sedition Acts. They argued that Congress had acted unconstitutionally in using tariff policy to benefit specific industries. Tariffs, they claimed, could be used only to raise revenue. On assuming the presidency in 1829, Jackson ignored the South Carolina statement of nullification. He excluded Calhoun, his vice president, from influence or power. Tariff revisions in 1832 brought little relief to the South. Sensing futility, Calhoun resigned the vice presidency and became a U.S. senator. In November 1832, South Carolina leaders took the radical step of declaring federal tariffs null and void in their state as of February 1, 1833. The constitutional crisis had begun. In response, Jackson sent armed ships to Charleston Harbor and threatened to invade the state. He pushed a force bill through Congress, which defined South Carolina's stance as treason and authorized military action to collect federal tariffs. Meanwhile, Congress passed a revised tariff that was more acceptable to the South, reducing tariffs to their 1816 levels. On March 1, 1833, Congress passed both the new tariff and the force bill at once. South Carolina withdrew its nullification of the old tariff and then nullified the force bill. It was a symbolic gesture since federal force was no longer required. The constitutional question about the scope of federal power relative to states' rights was far from settled, however. To the contrary, it had only grown. Could a state refuse to follow federal law it determined to be unconstitutional? The question applied not just to tariffs, but also to the question of slavery. As anti-slavery voices in the North grew louder, many white Southerners began to wonder if a Northern-dominated federal government might try to end slavery in the South. Could federal law be nullified in that case? President Jackson's third major political battle concerned the Second Bank of the United States. Since its recharter in 1816, the bank had played an important role in the growing U.S. economy. Expanded to 29 branches, it handled the federal government's deposits, extended credit and loans, and issued banknotes. Since the United States still lacked a federal currency, notes from the bank had become the country's most stable currency by 1830. Jackson, however, opposed the bank because it concentrated great economic power in the hands of a few private individuals. National Republican, or Whig, Senators Daniel Webster and Henry Clay decided to force the issue. They convinced the bank to apply for charter renewal in 1832, even though the existing charter ran until 1836. It seemed like a smart political strategy at the time. Convinced of the bank's popularity, they believed Jackson would not dare veto the bank and face an angry public on the eve of an election. But if he did veto the bill, they reasoned that the bank would survive on an override vote by a new Congress swept into power on the anti-Jackson tide. Should Jackson veto it, Clay declared, I will veto him. At first, the plan seemed to work. The bank applied for rechartering, and Congress voted to renew. Jackson, angry at being manipulated, issued his veto. 
but Clay and Webster had radically misjudged the bank's popularity. Jackson wrote a scathing veto message, appealing directly to public opinion and positioning himself as the champion of the democratic masses against the moneyed power. When the laws undertake to grant titles, gratuities, and exclusive privileges to make the rich richer and the most potent more powerful, Jackson wrote, the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, and laborers, who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves, have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. Clay and his supporters found Jackson's economic ideas and his rhetoric of class antagonism so absurd that they distributed thousands of copies of the bank veto as campaign material for their own party. A confident Henry Clay headed his party's ticket for the presidency, but their political strategy backfired spectacularly. The language of deep social antagonism resonated with many Americans. Forced to choose between the aristocracy and the people, read one set of state resolutions, Jackson, quote-unquote, stands by the people. He won the election easily, gaining 55% of the popular vote and 219 electoral votes to Clay's 49. Jackson's party still controlled Congress, so no override was possible. Jackson had won his epic battle against the bank. As one newspaper put it, Jackson had saved... Quote, the people from being enslaved by the corruptions of a moneyed aristocracy, end quote. But the war was not yet over. Wanting to destroy the bank immediately, Jackson ordered the sizable federal deposits removed from the bank's vaults and placed into Democratic allied state banks. In retaliation, the Bank of the United States raised interest rates and called in loans. This action caused a brief economic crisis in 1833 but it supported Jackson's claim that the bank was too powerful for the country's good. Unleashed and unregulated, the economy moved into high gear. By coincidence, an excess of silver from Mexican mines had recently made its way into American banks, giving bankers license to print more banknotes. From 1834 to 1837, inflation soared. Prices of basic goods rose more than 50%. States chartered hundreds of new private banks, each issuing its own banknotes. Entrepreneurs borrowed and invested money. The webs of credit and debt relationships that characterized the American economy grew denser still. Western land sales boomed. In 1834, about 4.5 million acres of the public domain had been sold, the highest annual volume since 1818. By 1836, the total reached an astonishing 20 million acres. In one respect, the economy attained an admirable goal. The national debt was paid off. For the only time in its history, the U.S. government had a monetary surplus between 1835 and 1837. Much of that surplus, however, consisted of questionable bank currencies, bloated, diseased currencies in Jackson's vivid terminology. As would so often be the case in American history, as long as the boom continued, few people paused to worry about what would happen when the bust eventually came. The country's booming economy and rapidly democratizing politics transformed its social and cultural life. For many families in the 1830s, especially in the commercialized Northeast, standards of living rose, consumption patterns changed, and the nature and location of work shifted in subtle but significant ways. These developments resulted in new cultural ideas about men, women, and children's education. Extraordinary new religious and reform movements burgeoned from this fertile mix. The revival of evangelical religion known as the Second Great Awakening revolutionized religious life in the country and inspired far-reaching social movements championing temperance, moral reform, and the abolition of slavery. In agricultural and artisanal settings, work and home life were largely inseparable. Families worked together in a mostly cashless economy. The economic changes after 1815 increasingly brought cash to the household, especially in the manufacturing and urban northeast. Farmers and tradesmen sold products in a market, and bankers, bookkeepers, shoemakers, and canal diggers earned regular salaries or wages. Many men now worked at an office or a store, while women in the growing middle classes stayed at home. By the 1830s, the increased separation between work and home provoked profound changes in ideas about gender. In 
The concept of separate spheres rested on the idea that husbands found their status and authority in the new world of work, leaving wives to tend to home and family. Sermons, advice books, periodicals, and novels reinforced this idea that men and women inhabited separate public and domestic realms. The home became defined as a feminine private space, sharply distinct from the masculine sphere of work. To woman it belongs to elevate the intellectual character of her household and to kindle the fires of mental activity in childhood, wrote Mrs. A. J. Graves in a popular book titled Advice to American Women. The idea gained in popularity that women possessed a superior moral virtue best suiting them to the domestic sphere, while men are better equipped to deal in the public sphere of politics and business, where so much underhandedness and lack of virtue predominated, and was sometimes thought necessary in order to achieve higher goals. To expect women to enter the public sphere would be to ask women to debase themselves, which was unacceptable. It put women on a higher pedestal, and some men may honestly have believed it true, but in any case it effectively kept women away from politics as anything much more than observers except for the wives of high-ranking politicians. Nevertheless, the Jacksonian period is the time when aspirants to public office were encouraged to impress women as well as men. Senator Davy Crockett of Tennessee in 1833 advised fledgling politicians to flatter ladies and kiss their babies because a woman's influence over her husband was always greater than any man would publicly admit. Some men and women tried to argue that women's strong moral influence rendered them ultimately more powerful and superior to men, though clearly few women, and arguably fewer men, actually believed this. Women's experiences were more complicated than such cultural prescriptions indicated. Although the vast majority of married white women did not hold paying jobs, their homes required time-consuming labor. But the advice books treated housework as a loving familial duty, making it invisible in an economy that valued work by the cash it generated. What was more, many wives contributed to family income by taking in boarders or sewing for pay. Wives in the poorest classes, including most free black wives, did not have the luxury of husbands earning adequate wages. For them, work as a servant or a laundress was a necessary part of family income, and also a matter of personal survival. The idea of separate spheres did not gain such cultural power because it was so true, however, but rather because it was so useful to the society's economic, political, and cultural life. In the emerging capitalist economy of the 19th century, was not a passion for gain traditionally known as avarice? And were not values of competition and acquisitiveness traditionally deemed to be sinful? Here is where the concept of separate spheres came to the rescue. Because women were believed to have special endowments of private virtues, piety, benevolence, sentimentality, morality, they could make the home into a refuge from the cruel and competitive world of market relations. The home, now understood as the exclusive domain of women, became the source of intimacy, love, and safety, of domesticity. This formulation of gender difference helped smooth the path for Americans experiencing rapid and disorienting economic changes. Both men and women of the middle classes benefited. Men were set free to pursue wealth, while women gained moral authority within the home. Although they had broad cultural power, these new gender ideals had limited relevance beyond white families of the middle and upper classes, nor did they emerge unchallenged. Radical voices like those of the Grimke sisters, for example, questioned whether virtue and duty had separate masculine and feminine manifestations at all. The ideology of separate spheres could also open up a few new opportunities for women outside the home. By the 1830s, especially in the North, state-supported public school systems had become the norm. They produced pupils of both sexes able to read, write, and calculate, and thus participate in the growing market economy. Literacy rates for white females climbed dramatically, rivaling the rates for white males for the first time. Building on older ideas that it was the women's role to educate their children, as seen in the concept of Republican motherhood, School districts often hired female teachers. Catherine Beecher, the daughter of a prominent New England clergyman, argued that women should be trained as teachers of children. 
Men, she argued in supporting the idea of innate female virtue, were too harsh and intimidating to be good secondary school teachers and are better suited to teaching college-age young men. An added advantage from the perspective of legislatures wincing at the price of public school systems was that women could be hired more cheaply. The vast majority of male youths left public school at age 14 to apprentice in trades or embark on business careers by seeking entry-level clerkships in the growing urban centers. Many young women, meanwhile, headed for mill towns or cities to work in the expanding service sector as seamstresses and domestic servants. For the first time, large numbers of young people escaped the watchful eyes of their parents, transforming the institution of the family. As the economy reshaped gender and family relations, a newly invigorated evangelical Protestantism gained momentum in the 1820s and 1830s. Among the most serious adherents were men and women of the new merchant classes, whose self-discipline in pursuing market ambitions meshed with the message of self-discipline in pursuit of spiritual perfection. The outburst of evangelical fervor animated enormous campaigns to eliminate alcohol abuse and eradicate sexual sin, among others. Millions of Americans took the temperance pledge to abstain from alcohol, and thousands became involved in efforts to end prostitution and find other ways to reform and perfect American society. The earliest manifestations of this fervent piety, which historians call the Second Great Awakening, appeared in 1801 in rural Kentucky, when a crowd of 10,000 people camped out on a hillside at Cane Ridge for a revival meeting that lasted several days. By the 18-teens and 1820s, revivalism had spread across the Atlantic seaboard states. The gatherings attracted women and men hungry for an emotional, even ecstatic spiritual experience. One eyewitness reported that some of the people were singing, others praying, some crying for mercy. At one time, I saw at least 500 swept down in a moment, as if a battery of a thousand guns had been opened upon them, and then immediately followed shrieks and shouts that rent the very heavens. Cane Ridge established the idea of the camp meeting, better known today as the tent revival, but the dynamics are the same. Church members, religious seekers, and the curious would converge at some large outdoor space for as briefly as a day or as long as a week to hear marathon evangelical preaching and perhaps have an intense conversion experience. Very often, the spiritually overcome might exhibit strange behaviors known as charisms, fainting, falling into trances, speaking in tongues, suffering involuntary bodily movements that observers called the jerks, or spontaneously issuing dire prophecies of the apocalypse to come, or simply testifying. In this respect, the crowd could be just as much a part of the show as the evangelical preacher. Such mass gatherings were not exclusively of churchgoers or devout Christians, however. Populist politicians seized upon the benefit of being seen at such events, where they could also glad-hand voters and gain support in an upcoming election. Vendors swooped in to sell food and drink at extended camp meetings, while others showed up to sell Bibles and religious paraphernalia. Considering that attendees would show up with cash in hand for such things, pickpockets could be sure to show up as well, but the especially savvy and well-spoken con artist could simply proclaim himself to be an evangelical preacher and usually be given a chance to try his hand, and hopefully pocket some cash from the collection basket he made sure to pass around. Camp meetings were always raucous affairs and were guaranteed to draw huge crowds in a time when most people did not have access to any form of entertainment apart from what they could devise for themselves at home or perhaps enjoy if they lived near to a courthouse. Not everyone thought camp meetings were a good thing, some critics complaining that the novelty and spectacle of such events distracted from proper Christian worship. From 1800 to 1820, church membership doubled in the United States, much of it among the evangelical denominations. Methodists, Baptists, and Presbyterians formed the core of the movement. Women served as its spiritual foot soldiers. Drawn in great numbers, wives and mothers typically recruited husbands and sons to join them. A notable leader of the Second Great Awakening was a lawyer-turned-minister named Charles Grandison Finney. Finney lived in western New York, 
where the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825 intensely altered the social and economic landscape. Rapid industrialization and commercialization came with other side effects, however, such as prostitution, drinking, and gambling. Finney saw New York canal towns as ripe for evangelical awakening. In Rochester, he launched a revival in 1830 that lasted six months and generated thousands of converts. Finney was noteworthy for the innovations he introduced to evangelicalism, specifically a degree of showmanship and spectacle previously unseen in American Christianity. He encouraged lay preaching, even by women, and gathered an entourage that traveled with him along the Erie Canal in upstate New York, which came to be known as the Burned Over District due to the scorching of the area with the fires of evangelicalism. He made sure that newspapers advertised his camp meetings and sermons in churches ahead of time to ensure large crowds, and that his outdoor events had a large stage built with theater-type seating spread out in front for as many people as possible. The first row of seats were reserved, however, for those during his sermons who felt their conversion coming on and needed to come closer to him so that he could pull them over the threshold, and these seats he called anxious benches. He was very charismatic, and his cold blue eyes gave his gaze an intensity that startled people who met him. One acquaintance said that it was as if he could see straight into your soul and see all of your sins. As he made repeat visits to towns and cities, he used local contacts to identify people in the crowd who had some interesting story that Finney could use to step out into the crowd, something preachers had never done before, and address them directly with knowledge that to the subjects must have seemed divinely obtained. Another famous evangelical was Lorenzo Dow, who cultivated the look and aura of an Old Testament prophet and was known for preaching sometimes perched in trees. He would make use of the sun for effect, positioning his stage facing east so that at a crucial moment in his sermon the setting sun would be behind his head, bathing him in an angelic glow. George Whitfield initiated certain aspects of stagecraft to his preaching in the 18th century awakening, but Finney and Dow took such theatricality to all new levels in the Second Great Awakening to redefine American evangelicalism. Finney's message, directed primarily at the business classes, promoted a public-spirited outreach. Evangelicals supported Sunday schools to bring piety to children. They battled to honor the Sabbath by ending mail delivery, stopping public transport, and closing shops on Sundays. Many women formed missionary societies that distributed millions of Bibles and religious tracts. Through such avenues, evangelical religion further expanded women's spheres of influence. Finney adopted the tactics of Jacksonian-era politicians, publicity, argumentation, rallies, and speeches, to sell his cause. Not content with individual perfection, many evangelical reformers sought to perfect society as well. Their first target was alcohol consumption, which had grown among all social classes in the decades up to 1830. A lively saloon culture fostered drink and camaraderie among laborers, while after-dinner whiskey or sherry was common in elite homes. Colleges before 1820 routinely served students a pint of ale with meals, and the military included rum in the daily ration. Organized opposition to drinking first emerged in the 18-teens among health and religious reformers. In 1826, Lyman Beecher, a Connecticut minister of an awakened church, formed the American Temperance Society. It maintained that drinking led to poverty, idleness, crime, and family violence. Temperance lecturers spread the word, and middle-class drinking began a steep decline. One powerful tool of persuasion was the temperance pledge, which many business owners began to require of employees. In 1836, leaders of the temperance movement regrouped into a new society, the American Temperance Union, which demanded total abstinence from its adherents. The campaign against alcohol moved beyond individual moral persuasion into the realm of politics. Reformers began trying to deny taverns and liquor licenses. By 1845, temperance advocates had succeeded in dramatically reducing alcohol consumption, in just 15 years, per capita consumption had fallen by 75%. More controversial than temperance was a social movement called moral reform. It first aimed at public morals in general, but quickly narrowed to target sexual sin. In 
In 1833, a group of Finneyite women started the New York Female Moral Reform Society. Under the leadership of Margaret Pryor, among others, its members insisted that uncontrolled male sexuality manifested in seduction and prostitution posed a serious threat to society. Within five years, more than 4,000 auxiliary groups of women had sprung up, mostly in New England, New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. In its conviction that women had a duty to speak out about unspeakable things, the Moral Reform Society pushed the limits of female public expression. But these women did not regard themselves as radicals. They were pursuing the logic of a gender system that defined home protection and morality as women's special sphere and a spiritual conviction that called for the eradication of sin. Eradicating sin on the personal level was certainly one goal, but a broader goal was to expunge national sins in order to justify the United States' identity as what American Christians at the time called an elect nation. A central aspect of Christianity is the belief that at some point in the future there will be a catastrophic end to this world and its replacement with a perfect new one, marked by the second coming of Jesus Christ and the final judgment of the saved and the damned, all of which is predicted in the Apocalypse of John, better known as the Book of Revelation in the Bible. It was widely believed that before the second coming happens, the end will be preceded by a thousand-year period wherein the righteous will rule the world, during which there will be universal peace and harmony, and this is an event called the Millennium. Pious reformers believed that the United States would be the seat of the Millennial Kingdom, but not before it had expunged its shortcomings and worked to perfect itself. The lack of a standardized national education was one arena of activity, pushed by Horace Mann and Catherine Beecher. Mann looked with dismay at the number of parochial schools going up in the Northeast as the numbers of Irish Catholic immigrants began to rise in the 1830s and 1840s, and he advocated for state-supported public schools to propagate Protestant Christian ideas. Up to this point, local governments occasionally funded elementary education for boys, while private schools and tutors catered to the wealthy. The notion that states or even the nation should fund elementary education according to a standardized curriculum was a revolutionary idea, but man harnessed his anti-Catholic bigotry to convince state legislatures to establish schools and compel attendance by law. The result was an enormous increase in overall literacy rates, and the further expansion of print culture, which similarly introduced an explosion of literary achievement that allowed the United States to step out of the artistic shadow of Western Europe. While universal public education was one goal, another was criminal justice reform. Punishments for crime in early 19th century America had not much changed from the previous century. Murder, grand theft, and rape were still punished by hanging, while less serious crimes were punished with fines, corporal punishment, and public humiliation. Jails were little more than holding cells for the accused awaiting trial if not released on bond. Women tended to be punished more lightly than men unless charged with a capital offense. In Pennsylvania, Quakers innovated the idea of the penitentiary, a kind of prison modeled on a medieval monastery in which male criminals convicted of felonies would be confined to cells furnished with a cot, chamber pot, wash stand, and a bowl, and one other item, a Bible. They were to spend 23 hours a day in their cells with nothing to do except read their Bibles, getting an hour of physical exercise every day in large courtyards. The idea was that they would learn the error of their ways and emerge after a period determined by the severity of their crime as Reformed Christians. The result was not as the Quakers had hoped, but communities liked the idea of putting dangerous criminals away for long periods of time, and the idea persists to the present day, although now penitentiaries are more commonly referred to as correctional facilities. Jails and early prisons tended to have a portion of their inmates who had committed crimes due to their suffering from mental illnesses, and in the 18th and 19th centuries little was understood about the brain and mental illness. Oftentimes sufferers would be locked up in hospitals rather than jails, where care was inconsistent and sometimes non-existent. Dorothea Dix, a nurse, argued that the mentally ill should be housed in their own hospitals, which she called asylums, where doctors could study them exclusively and learn more about their torments in hopes of finding effective treatments and cures. 
She also pushed for greater hygiene and cleanliness in hospitals, where too often patients with relatively minor illnesses or injuries developed worse conditions or died of infections that might have been prevented with daily washing and changing of patients' clothing, bandages, and bedding, as well as requiring doctors to wash their hands thoroughly between surgeries and seeing patients. Along similar lines, and closely related to the temperance movement, some reformers focused on bodily reforms as the key to spiritual and social transformation. These body reformers, to one degree or another, believed that the universal adoption of their proposed reforms would usher in not just a healthier American citizenry, but the very millennium itself, while the alternative would result in social apocalypse. Sylvester Graham, while in his mid-thirties, reflected upon a life that wildly alternated between self-indulgence and guilt-ridden asceticism, and by 1831 had concluded that various external stimuli shocked the body's systems and drained vital energy. Spicy foods, especially red meat, and more so when seasoned, commercially produced breads, coffee and tea, alcohol, tobacco, and most irritating to the body of all, sex. He invented a bland cracker type of bread made from unbolted flour and devised an extremely basic ungarnished vegetarian diet around his graham crackers, lubricated either by water or milk. He railed against excessive sexuality and sexual activity itself, recommending intercourse take place only once a month at the most, as more frequent relations were too shocking to the body systems and damaged the internal organs and insisted that wholesome morning calisthenics replace sexual intercourse entirely. Daily activity was to be rigorously routine, variety again considered to be too stimulating and thus disruptive of natural rhythms and balance. A simple vegetarian diet prevented the internal organs from heating up, sleeping in feather beds and wearing tight, heavy clothing kept the body too warm and damaged the vital organs. Thus, all were to be repudiated in favor of loose, light clothing, sparse bedding, cold baths, and a simple biblical diet, sexual abstinence, and modest regular exercise. The growing popularity of personal and societal perfectionism found expression in other ways, some of which have roots stretching back deep in the past. Monasteries were thought to be enclaves of Christian purity and devotion when they first appeared during the early medieval period and utopian visionaries in America sought to make this idea one that encompassed the entire nation. An early model was that of the Shakers, followers of a charismatic leader, Mother Anne Lee, who converted to a variant form of Quakerism in England before immigrating to revolutionary America in the mid-1770s with a band of disciples who established a commune near Albany, New York. Lee, who believed that sexual intercourse was the means by which original sin propagated in the world, demanded strict celibacy and sexual segregation in Shaker communities, urging her followers to dedicate their hands to work and their hearts to God. They practiced a form of worship that included original hymns sung to choreographed movements and dances. They never, strictly speaking, shook like some Quakers did. The neatness and order found in Shaker communities impressed visitors and inspired the creation of many Shaker villages throughout New England, New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio over the course of the early 19th century. They flourished through most of the 1800s, but too many found a life of celibacy too hard to endure, and so the community struggled with fluctuating and ultimately declining populations. The ideas of communalism and egalitarianism that defined Shaker village life led some to adopt it as a model for their own expressions of what historians call utopian socialism. Charles Fourier, a French immigrant, established communities in the Midwest that mimicked Shaker villages, but based on a secular philosophy of egalitarianism and moral uprightness. A philosophical movement inspired by Fourierism in New England propagated a kind of spiritualism called transcendentalism, and devotees founded a kind of artist's commune at Brook Farm near Boston that emphasized a reconnection with nature as a cure for a society that was fast becoming too industrialized and materialistic. The Fourierist communes and Brook Farm failed to survive for more than five or six years, but the quest to build the perfect community endured. 
the Oneida community went beyond the Fourierist notion of communalism. John Humphrey Noyes, the leader of Oneida, believed that American society's commitment to private property made people greedy and selfish. Propounding an idea that he called Bible communism, Noyes claimed that the root of private property lay in marriage, in husbands' conviction that their wives were their exclusive property. With support from a sizable inheritance, Noyes organized the Oneida community in upstate New York in 1848 to abolish marital property rights by permitting sexual intercourse between any consenting man and woman in the community. He also required all members to relinquish their economic property to the community. Most of their neighbors considered Oneidans dangerous adulterers. The practices that set Oneida apart from its mainstream neighbors strengthened the community and it survived long after the Civil War, but it did not change the institutions of marriage and private property in America at large. The Oneida community suffered ultimately from a reverse of what had hindered the Shakers. Jealousy and sexual competition eventually destroyed their communal utopia. While the Shakers became famous for the quality of their furniture making and invention of labor-saving devices, the Oneidans specialized in metalworking, eventually making a name for themselves as crafters of fine silverware. Following the collapse of the Oneida community, former members eventually created the Oneida Company that continues to this day to make silverware and kitchen utensils. The explosion of religiosity engendered by the Second Great Awakening and the ensuing democratization of American Christianity led to a profusion of new religious groups and movements. The most famous and enduring of these is Mormonism. In upstate New York, in the midst of the burned-over district, young Joseph Smith, Jr., no relation, was out looking for hidden treasure when he claimed to have been visited by an angel calling himself Moroni, who directed him to a hill where he was to dig and uncover a set of golden tablets inscribed with a new book of the Bible called the Book of Mormon. He translated these strange tablets into English from a previously unknown language derived from ancient Hebrew and Egyptian, and convinced many that the original Garden of Eden was actually located near Independence, Missouri, not in the Holy Land, and that during the 40 days between Jesus Christ's resurrection and ascension to heaven that he visited the Americas to preach to the Indians. The Book of Mormon claims to be an account of a lost Israeli tribe that found its way to North America and eventually split between warring factions, one good, the other evil. The evil Lamanites were victorious, and the lone Nephite survivor, Mormon, wrote the entire story down on the tablet Smith claimed to have found. He believed that Mormonism was the culmination and perfection of Christianity, and that it would eventually supplant all other forms of Christianity in the world, and then would come the millennium. Some scoffed at Smith's claims, but thousands converted, enduring much hostility and setbacks throughout the period of the Second Great Awakening. Around the time Mormonism was gaining ground in New York, near Albany, a Baptist preacher and farmer, William Miller, believed that he had discovered a numerical formula in the Bible that told him exactly when the second coming was going to happen. He published his findings beginning in 1840, which predicted that the second coming would happen between March and October of the year 1843. Thousands believed Miller, who said that the one event that would prove him right is that just before Christ returns, the truly faithful would be raptured into the sky, an idea first floated by an English theologian whose works Miller had read. The year 1843 came and went uneventfully, but his most fervent disciples decided that there had been a slight error in his math, and that 1844 would be the glorious year. And tens of thousands of believers waited anxiously in 1844 for the rapture, which of course did not happen an event the Millerites called the Great Disappointment. While many mocked the Millerites for their folly, a core of true believers eventually merged with a group of Seventh-day Baptists in Maine to form the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which remains a denomination today. The campaign to eradicate sin was not limited to these and other endeavors. In the 1830s, the decades-old abolitionist movement entered a new chapter, this second wave built on several important foundations. First was a powerful tradition of organizing and militancy against slavery among African Americans, both free and enslaved. 
Second was the transatlantic anti-slavery movement that began in the 18th century centered in Great Britain. It succeeded in abolishing the Atlantic slave trade in 1807 and then slavery itself throughout the British Empire in 1834. The most immediate trigger for the new wave of abolitionism, however, was the opposition to the American Colonization Society, or ACS. Founded in 1817 by Maryland and Virginia planters, the ACS promoted the gradual emancipation of slaves followed by their removal or colonization to Africa, seen to advocate a moderate position between the growing defense of slavery and the mounting calls for its abolition, the ACS counted the country's most eminent political figures in its ranks. See here James Madison's membership card. Few slaves or free African Americans supported the movement, however. To the contrary, their insistent demands for slavery's immediate abolition began to gain attention among northern whites. In 1829, a Boston printer named David Walker published a fiery pamphlet titled An Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World. Condemning racism and invoking the egalitarian language of the Declaration of Independence, Walker hinted at racial violence if slavery did not end soon. In 1830, at the inaugural National Negro Convention in Philadelphia, 40 African Americans from nine states discussed the racism of American society and proposed immigration to Canada. In 1832 and 1833, a 28-year-old black woman named Maria Stewart delivered rousing public lectures on slavery and racial prejudice to black audiences in Boston. Her message gained broader circulation when a Boston newspaper published her lectures. Founded in 1831, the Liberator took anti-slavery agitation to new heights. Its founder and editor, William Lloyd Garrison, denounced moderation in response to the existence of slavery, demanding its immediate abolition instead. On this subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen, but urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. In 1832, Garrison's supporters started the New England Anti-Slavery Society. Activists in Philadelphia and New York organized similar groups in 1833. Soon, a dozen anti-slavery newspapers and scores of anti-slavery lecturers were spreading the word and inspiring the formation of new local societies. By 1837, 1,300 anti-slavery organizations existed across the North, with a membership totaling a quarter of a million men and women. One thing that must be understood is that anti-slavery thought ran across a spectrum. Radicals like Garrison advocating immediate abolition of slavery and the granting of citizenship to blacks stood at one end. At the other end stood moderates, who urged gradual emancipation and the freedmen's deportation to Africa. Most Northerners harbored deeply held beliefs in white supremacy, but believed that slavery was barbaric, and so were what I would call parlor abolitionists. They did not like slavery, but did not make their views known in public or join an anti-slavery society, hoping that somehow the problem could resolve itself without causing more turbulence. Nevertheless, most who supported slavery in both the South and the North did not distinguish between gradualists and immediatists. Many white Northerners reacted with fury at the abolitionists. Even if they were theoretically opposed to slavery, most thought the call for immediate abolition unwise. They viewed abolitionists as radical agitators who threatened the nation's unity. From 1834 to 1838, more than a hundred episodes of mob violence erupted against abolitionists and free blacks. On one occasion, crowds burned anti-slavery headquarters in Philadelphia and a black church and orphanage to the ground. In another incident, a rioting crowd killed Illinois abolitionist editor Elijah P. Lovejoy and destroyed his printing press. When the Grimke sisters lectured in 1837, some authorities tried to intimidate them and deny them meeting space. The following year, Rocks shattered windows when Angelina Grimke spoke at a female anti-slavery convention in Philadelphia. After the women fled the building, a mob burned it to the ground. Despite the physical dangers, large numbers of northern women played a role in the movement. Most notable were the anti-slavery petitions they presented to the U.S. Congress with tens of thousands of signatures. At first, 
women framed the petitions as respectful memorials about the evils of slavery. Later, they demanded an end to slavery in the District of Columbia, which was under Congress's jurisdiction. With such tactics, anti-slavery women asserted their claim to speak on political issues independently of their husbands and fathers. Before long, women's activism on behalf of anti-slavery led them to write and speak about women's rights. Some began to see the oppression of slaves and of women as related issues. The denial of our duty to act is a bold denial of our right to act, Angelina Grimke declared in response to those who tried to silence her and her sister. And if we have no right to act, then may we well be termed the white slaves of the North, for, like our brethren in bonds, we must seal our lips in silence and despair. If the abolitionists did not secure an immediate end to slavery in the 1830s, they succeeded in making their cause the nation's central political issue by the end of the decade. The movement grew at least in part from the larger social and intellectual currents of the era. Millions of men and women in the 1830s found their initial inspiration in evangelical Protestantism's dual message, salvation was open to all and society needed to be perfected. The growing scope of the movement and its insistence that changing public opinion was the means to abolish slavery emerged from the democratized political culture of the Jacksonian era, an abolitionist activist mentality squared well with the interventionist tendencies of the Whig Party. Women participated in the many reform activities that grew out of evangelical churches. Women church members outnumbered men two to one and worked to put their religious ideas into practice by joining peace, temperance, anti-slavery, and other societies. Involvement in reform organizations gave a few women activists practical experience in such political arts as speaking in public, running a meeting, drafting resolutions, and circulating petitions. In 1840, a convention of British and American abolitionists took place in London, England, and William Lloyd Garrison was scheduled to be a featured speaker. The American contingent included Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and when they arrived, Garrison asked that the women speak as well, a request that was denied, as women in Britain were not allowed to speak at such events. Garrison is said to have declared that, If my sisters are not welcome to speak here, then neither am I and together they returned to the States. During the long voyage home, the ladies discussed how the status of white women in America was not much better than that of slaves, and resolved that abolitionism should also entail a campaign for women's equal rights and liberation from male domination. With Garrison's support, women's rights societies began to form throughout New England and New York. In 1848, about 300 reformers, led by Mott and Stanton, gathered at Seneca Falls, New York, for the first National Women's Rights Convention in the United States. As Stanton recalled, The general discontent I felt with women's portion as wife, mother, housekeeper, physician, and spiritual guide, and the wearied, anxious look of the majority of women impressed me with a strong feeling that some active measure should be taken to right the wrongs of society in general, and of women in particular. The Seneca Falls Declaration of Sentiments set an ambitious agenda to demand civil liberties for women and to right the wrongs of society. The Declaration proclaimed that the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man towards woman, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. In the style of the Declaration of Independence, the Seneca Falls Declaration demanded that women have immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States, particularly the inalienable right to the elective franchise. Nearly two dozen other women's rights conventions assembled before 1860, repeatedly calling for suffrage and an end to discrimination against women. But women had difficulty receiving a respectful hearing, much less achieving legislative action. Even so, the Seneca Falls Declaration served as a path-breaking manifesto of dissent against male supremacy and of support for women's suffrage. The Declaration inspired many women to challenge the barriers that limited their opportunities. But discrimination against women remained very strong because most men believed in and practiced male supremacy. So many women joined women's rights societies that other reformed movements suffered a loss of momentum, 
especially abolitionism, and so Mott and Stanton scaled back their activism on behalf of women's rights to restore priority to the abolition of slavery. By the mid-1830s, a tumultuous democratic political culture governed American life. Andrew Jackson, too ill to stand for a third term, made way for his vice president, Martin Van Buren. Van Buren was a skilled politician, but soon after his inauguration, the country's economy collapsed. A devastating panic in 1837, followed by another in 1839, brought the country to its knees. Meanwhile, as the institution of slavery continued to grow, so did its status as the country's preeminent political conflict. Van Buren of New York was known as the Little Magician for his consummate political talents. First a senator and then governor, he became Jackson's Secretary of State and then his running mate in 1832. Perhaps his greatest political achievement lay in building a sophisticated Democratic Party organization. Jackson favored Van Buren for the nomination in 1836, but starting in 1832, political parties chose their candidates through nominating conventions. In 1835, Van Buren won the convention balloting unanimously. His rival, the South Carolinian John C. Calhoun, sought to discredit Van Buren among Southern Democrats. Van Buren spent months assuring Southerners that he was a Northern man with Southern principles. It was a credible argument. His Dutch family hailed from the Hudson River counties in New York, where slavery had once flourished. His own family had owned slaves as late as the 18-teens. Calhoun succeeded in making trouble for Van Buren because white Southerners were growing ever more alarmed by the rise of Northern anti-slavery sentiment. When activists tried to circulate a million abolitionist pamphlets through the South in 1835, a bag of their mail was hijacked at the post office in Charleston, South Carolina. Crowds burned the pamphlets along with effigies of leading abolitionists. President Jackson condemned the theft, but instructed postmasters to use their judgment when deciding whether to allow such mail into the South. Southern censorship of the mail became a political issue in the North. Abolitionists did not fear escalating sectional tensions. To the contrary, it was one of the movement's objectives. When hundreds of anti-slavery petitions inundated Congress, Southern congressmen responded by passing a gag rule that prohibited entering the documents into the public record. They argued that a congressional act abolishing slavery was unconstitutional, a violation of white Southerners' property rights. Abolitionists like the Grimke sisters, on the other hand, saw the gag rule as a violation of their rights of free speech. Southerners' fear of the petitions suggested how effective they were. Van Buren shrewdly seized on the issues of male censorship and the gag rule to affirm his pro-Southern sympathies. Abolitionists were fanatics, he claimed, possibly under the influence of foreign agents, meaning British abolitionists, and promised that, as president, he would not allow any interference in Southern domestic institutions. If the first presidential elections were relatively staid affairs negotiated among gentlemanly elites, Jackson's charismatic personality shaped the elections of 1824, 1828, and 1832. The nation's democratic institutions entered a new stage in 1836, Van Buren, an exceptional backroom politician, was the first president to win the presidency through the new party system, an apparatus made up of local and state committees throughout the country and more than 400 partisan newspapers. The Whigs had also built a network of state-level organizations and loyal newspapers. Lacking a contender with nationwide support, three regional candidates opposed Van Buren, Senator Daniel Webster of Massachusetts, Hugh Lawson White of Tennessee, and General William Henry Harrison of Ohio. No single one of the three candidates could win the presidency alone, but together they nearly denied Van Buren a majority. Van Burenites saw the three Whig strategy as a plot to move the election to the House of Representatives. In the end, Van Buren won with 170 electoral votes. The other three received a total of 113. But Van Buren's victories came from narrow majorities, far below those Jackson had commanded. Van Buren successfully assembled a National Democratic Party with wins in both the North and the South, but he did so at a steep cost by committing Northern Democrats to a Southern pro-slavery agenda. Meanwhile, the three regional Whig candidates helped usher in victories at the state level. When Van Buren took office in March 1837, financial markets were already quaking. A month later, the country was plunged into crisis. The Panic of 1837 had multiple causes, some of them global. 
Bad harvests in Europe and a large trade imbalance between Britain and the United States caused the Bank of England to call in loans to American merchants. Meanwhile, a downturn in international cotton prices fed the growing disaster. Lacking access to credit, cotton merchants in the South could no longer meet their obligations. New York firms that had lent money to Southern merchants and planters began to fail, 98 of them in March and April of 1837 alone. Frightened citizens overwhelmed banks, trying to withdraw their money. Businesses rushed to sell their assets to pay off debts. Prices of stocks, bonds, and real estate all collapsed. The dynamic of the Panic of 1819 unfolded again with terrifying speed. Credit markets, which had seemed so stable, suddenly tumbled like a house of cards. Newspapers used the language of emotional states, excitement, anxiety, terror, panic, to describe the collapse. Such terms focused on human reactions to the crisis rather than on structural features of the economy. Lacking a sophisticated understanding of economic forces, few people could see the bigger picture, an interlinked capitalist world system coming into existence. To explain the crisis, Americans turned instead to politics, religion, or individual character. Some Whig leaders pointed to Jackson's anti-bank and hard money policies. New Yorker Philip Hone, a wealthy Whig, called the Jackson administration the most disastrous in the annals of the country for its wicked interference in banking and monetary matters. Others framed the devastation as divine retribution for the frenzy of speculation that gripped the nation. The Panic of 1837 subsided by 1838, but in 1839, another run on banks and wave of business failures further deflated the economy, creating a second panic. President Van Buren called a special session of Congress to consider an independent treasury system that could perform some of the functions of the former Bank of the United States. Such a system, funded by government deposits, would moderate inflation rates and stabilize credit markets. But Van Buren met strong resistance in Congress. His Treasury Secretary finally won approval in 1840, but by then Van Buren's chances of winning a second term in office had vanished. In 1840, the Whigs settled on William Henry Harrison to oppose Van Buren. The campaign mobilized voters as no presidential campaign ever had. This time, Whigs borrowed tricks from the Democrats. They portrayed Harrison as a common man born in a log cabin. In reality, he was born on a Virginia plantation. Campaign parades even featured toy log cabins. They emphasized his experience fighting Indians to give him a Jacksonian aura. Whigs staged boisterous rallies around the country, drumming up mass appeal with parades and shows. Women participated in rallies as never before. Some 78% of eligible voters cast ballots, the highest percentage ever in American history. Harrison took 53% of the popular vote and won a resounding 234 electoral college votes to Van Buren's 60 votes. Harrison's election closed a decade that brought democracy and the figure of the common man to the center of American politics. Economic transformations help explain the rapid changes of the 1830s. Transportation advances accelerated the circulation of goods and people. Water-powered manufacturing began to change the nature of labor. Great waves of land auctions redistributed territory violently seized from Indians. Slavery expanded into vast new territories of the Southwest. Trade and banking mushroomed pulling ever-expanding parts of the continent into an increasingly interlinked global economic system. Two sharp economic downturns in 1819 and 1837 and then 39 again offered sobering lessons about speculative fever. Andrew Jackson symbolized this age of opportunity more than any single figure. His fame as an aggressive general, victorious Indian fighter, champion of the common man, tormentor of the moneyed interests, and defender of slavery – attracted growing numbers of voters to the Democratic Party. Democrats emerged as the champions of personal liberty, free competition, and egalitarian opportunity for all white men. A vocal segment of the population challenged the Jacksonian vision. Inspired by the Second Great Awakening, evangelical reformers targeted personal vices and social problems. They joined forces with wealthy lawyers and merchants in the North and South who favored a national bank and protective tariffs. The Whigs became the party of activist moralism and state-sponsored entrepreneurship. Voters were male, of course, but thousands of reform-minded women expanded the political sphere by mobilizing the ideology of separate spheres to insert themselves as moral voices in national politics. They engaged in reform activities and disseminated petitions on the issues of Indian removal and slavery. 
A few exceptional women, like Sarah and Angelina Grimke, even became famous in their own right. National politics in the 1830s were more divided than at any time since the 1790s. With the great expansion of the suffrage, the new party system of Democrats and Whigs reached much deeper into the electorate than had the first party system of Federalists and Democratic Republicans. Politics acquired immediacy and excitement, causing nearly four out of five white men to cast ballots in 1840. All these changes laid the groundwork for the political and social trends of the 1840s and 1850s. Continued urban growth, westward expansion, and industrialization sustained the Democrat-Whig split in politics, but they created new divisions as well. In particular, the spectacular growth of slavery, from 681,000 slaves in 1790 to 2.5 million by 1840, heading to 4 million by 1860, would raise profound questions about the nature of American democracy, even as it seemed to stand at the vanguard of the new liberal societies of the Atlantic world. Ultimately, slavery would prove to be a problem that the political system, for all its resiliency, could not solve.